Okay, okay. Good morning, Fairfield. Happy Easter. You'll notice I'm wearing a tie this time. Fun fact, I've worn this same shirt and tie for the past five Easters. Eagle-eyed viewers will notice that. Tie clip was about two years ago. But anyway, the uh, <clears throat> I may be Quaker now, but the Baptist in me dies hard. So um, the tie has to come out on Easter Sunday. Welcome to Fairfield Friends Meeting for Worship, Home Edition, number four. It is Easter Sunday, so I want to wish you all a happy Easter. Thank you for spending time with us, letting us come into your homes virtually, and uh, I hope you enjoy today's service. Today's opening thought is from Matthias Beyer. Hello, friends. My name is Matthias Beyer. In this season of the coronavirus pandemic, I've been thinking a lot about fear and how it relates to the meaning of Easter. At its best, our fears allow us to prepare for danger and to do what we need to do to ensure our survival. At its worst, our fears become like a balloon sitting atop our nose and blocking the vision of the beauty of the world and threatening our physical, psychological, social and spiritual survival. Fear then is oppressive and preoccupies us so much that we can't connect with ourselves, with others or with the world. The message of Easter is an answer to this kind of absolute fear. The kingdom of God, or as I like to call it in a post-monarchical world, the home of God, is like a needle that pops the balloon of fear. The Easter story uses the metaphor of the stone rolled away, opening the tomb in which fear condemns us to death, to not mattering and to insignificance. Our absolute fears turn life into a grave. In contrast, Easter is the message of a God who permeates the entire finite existence with rays of an infinite love and meaning that opens our vision and infuses us with the spirit of aliveness and passion. The message of death and resurrection of Easter is a very profound one. Our spirit is capable of magnifying fear or trust to absolute levels. Fear can magnify everything that reminds us of our finitude. Pain, sickness, loss. And foremost, it can make us interpret the very fact that one day we will die as a sure sign that we ultimately don't matter, are insignificant and worthless. That fear can also turn the very idea of God into an absolutely frightful and capricious figure. Jesus popped the balloon of fear. Most importantly, he popped the balloon that God is a narcissistic, punishing and distant, much in the style of a detective, prosecutor, relentless judge or emperor. Jesus popped the balloon of fear through the attitude of an absolute trust and love that characterized him as a person because he discovered himself as absolutely wanted and loved by God. His way of relating engendered a deep sense of trust and love. He embodied the spirit of aliveness and passion that dispel the all-powerfulness of the balloon of our fears. He himself did not give in to the fear that wanted him to betray those who had glimpsed the God of unconditional love and acceptance. Because such a God pops the balloon of all the oppressive forces inside and outside, that is why Jesus was killed. 
And that is also why his attitude and message became so powerful to change the course of humankind. I have to add in parenthesis here that this is also the reason why his message has been co-opted so many times throughout history in an attempt to neutralize it. But that is for another occasion. The message of Jesus is clear. With the eyes of God, each of us can discover ourselves as a miracle every day. When we let the message in that God trusts, wants and loves us for the miracle we are, then we can learn to pop the balloon of all the forces that feed off of fear. Be they oppressive self dynamics of self loathing inside us or oppressive dynamics of injustice outside of us. We may not necessarily be able to control what others do or what fears may pop up in our minds, but supported by the vision of God that we're all miracles, like the lilies on the field or the birds singing their songs in blooming spring trees or lovers sharing intimate dances that balance closeness and distance, we can decrease in our spirit the significance and the impact of these fears and nurture a sense of trust in the goodness and fullness of our existence, others' existence, and of the world. The tomb is empty. The stone is rolled away. The balloon of fear is popped. The home of God is full of trust, abundance and love and welcomes every and each creature. In that spirit, I wish you a joyous and passion-filled Easter. I'm happy to welcome back Lee Edmondson, who's going to play for us on piano. He's going to play O oh Sacred Head, Now Wounded. Please enjoy.
Lee, thank you so much. We all appreciate that playing. Friends, it's time to share joys and concerns now. And uh, some of these are just general greetings to say hello on Easter. And we're happy to, to bring these to you now. Uh, the, first off, the Mork Wiley family in Norway has sent us a couple videos so we can get a peek into uh, where they like to go to see some water. And, uh, and they just want to share a nice greeting with us. So please enjoy this video message from the Mork Wiley family. Okay. Say hi. 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 So Greetings. here we are at home. Greetings from Norway. Here we are. The three of us, Jill, Liesl, Andre, Will, and Daisy too. So I guess the four of us. Daisy. At the beach. This is what we are doing. There's the beach, and this is where we like to come. There's a uh, diving board if you feel the need to go swimming in the fjord. This is the beach that we come to to swim. So we thought we would bring you out here and give you a look at what we would, what we do in the summer. And then oftentimes on the weekend, we'll walk down here. But look at the view. I'm not sure you can tell how beautiful it is. Cindy Hurst loves flowers that come out in springtime, and she sent me several photos of flowers uh, that are growing up around her house that she wanted to share with you all. So please enjoy a few photos of some spring flowers. Care of Cindy Hurst. Steve and Nita Kirchhoff shared a joy with us this week. They write, our granddaughter Eleanor, Lenny, age nine, did a great job doing the voiceover for a Kiwanis International PSA, featuring a wonderful message about how to cope with these trying times. Nita and I encourage friends to see it on the Kiwanis Facebook, Facebook page. The link is posted below in the video description uh, underneath this video, so friends can see that, that uh, PSA with featuring the voice talents of Eleanor Lenny. Despite the best efforts of healthcare workers, the care facility where Don Sheets lives has reported a case of COVID-19. The patient who had the virus has been moved to another building, but strict measures of isolation are now underway. With Don's dementia, this has been especially difficult for her. Cards from friends would be most comforting and reassuring to her at this time. Phil shared her address in his email this past Thursday. Julie Kindle shares that she appreciates all the calls and cards regarding her brother's death. She writes, It was so painful losing my brother and not being able to go to his funeral in Knoxville, Tennessee because of the COVID-19 restrictions. Please continue to hold Julie and her family in the light. Ron and Kay Fry have two granddaughters working in health care. Please remember them in prayer this week and always. And my friend Olya, on Friday, she and Otis were able to leave the hospital and go home. Um, though he still has some congestion and isn't 100% better, he's doing so much better than he was a week ago. So thank you so much for your prayers and for checking in, and please continue to pray that he makes a full and speedy recovery. Thank you. Please hold the friends and family of Jack Butler in the light. Uh, Jack was a friend of Fairfield as well as a retired teacher and he died this last week. Uh, we'd also like to hold the city of Mooresville in the light and specifically those whose homes and property was damaged in the tornado that came through this last week, um, including specifically Connie Geiger who lives next door to the meeting. And then finally I have a joy from Steve and Ellen Blacketer. Uh, they want to share a special Easter greeting to all of their friends at Fairfield meeting. Uh, may his presence, his power, and his love fill your life with joy and peace at Easter and always. Karen Hall O'Brien shares her joys. None of my immediate family, sons, brother, sister, nieces, and nephews, and grand relatives are ill, and they have all been isolating successfully. My niece was just accepted to a doctorate in psychology program. People are making masks and helping each other. She shared some concerns too. My Texas son and his family have been separated for more than a month and my son is alone, working overtime and trying to keep the family afloat financially. My brother, Arlo Hall, 
at First Friends Richmond, continues battling bone cancer, doing well at the moment, but going nuts from isolation. Lindsay Southwick says, I have some concerns and asked for prayers for my friend TJ Reynolds, who lost his father this morning. I also ask for prayers for the undocumented families I'm working with who are in danger of losing home, lack food, and receive no government assistance. I ask to hold all of the health and mental health workers in the light. Pam and Bill Smith write, we have a new great niece, Lorraine Olivia Van Ness, born April 6th, three weeks early, weighing four pounds, 15 ounces, and 18 inches long. Mom Elizabeth and baby are doing well at home now. Here's the happy family. Friends, thank you for sharing those joys and concerns. Uh, now I think it's time for another birthday hand washing break. And based on how well received a certain guest star was last week, I think we have a new, uh, a new thing we should try. Hey everybody. <laughs> So we had some, we had one notable critic last week when I was washing my hands. So Laura has volunteered to sing today's birthday hand washing songs. <laughs> we want to wish happy birthday to Chase Roden and Carolyn Fry. So without further ado, Laura, take it away. This is what I get for mouthing off. <laughs> Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Chase Rodin, <laughs> happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday Carolyn Fry, <laughs> happy birthday to you. Yay! Public health! <laughs> I have a, just a couple of announcements to share this week. Some friends sent out some vote by mail information with step-by-step -step instructions um, to the email blast, but uh, we're gonna also post that in the video description down below. So you can um, follow that and take steps you need to, but to vote by mail, keep yourself safe and healthy and still be an active uh, participant in our democracy. Electronic giving is still available to uh, donate to Fairfield Friends via PayPal. Please send your donations to fairfieldgiving at gmail.com. And you choose the send money to a friend option. You can also mail your donation by check to Karen Held, Fairfield, Fairfield Friends Meeting, P.O. Box 45 in Canby, Indiana, 46113. And again, that information will be down in the video description. Friends, this is going to be a little helpful tutorial for those of you. When, when I refer to links in the description of the video, I thought I'd show you what I meant. So here is me last week with the open collar Quaker look going on there. So if you're looking at a YouTube video, scroll down to the description and click on show more. Click on that and you can see all the helpful information and links that we're going to post so you can uh, access the things that you hear during the video that you want to that you want to uh, keep track of, and check it out. Last week, 445 views and one dislike. Oh well, thanks, mom. Now we have our second piece of music for this video service. It's Lee Edmondson again playing "Christ the Lord Is Risen." Here's Lee.
Thank you again, Lee. Now it's time for scripture reading brought to you by Cindy Streetelmeyer. Here's Cindy. A reading from Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Thank you, Cindy. And thank you also to Lee Edmondson for today's music, and Laura J. Ballinger and David for filming her, and Amanda Ganey and Tony Holman for helping me share joys and concerns. And thank you all for spending Easter morning with us and, invi and inviting us into your homes and, and sharing this time. And now I'm happy to hand it over to Phil Gully for today's message. Bye, everybody. Happy Easter morning, friends. What comes after death? I've been thinking about that this week, partly because it's Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, and partly because this pandemic is causing me to wonder what comes after this virus has departed or been defeated. What comes after death? I suspect you've been thinking about that too. I remember after my mom passed away, I was visiting with my dad and he looked at me and asked, what do I do now? He could have asked that question any number of ways. What do I focus on now? How do I live now? How will my life be different now? Those are questions all of us ask when our lives have been upended. Those are scary questions to ask. When the women went to visit the tomb of Jesus and met a young man who told them Jesus had risen and urged them to go tell others, they fled from the tomb, trembling and astonished and said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. What do we do now? What comes after death? I was talking with a mother and father the other day while out for a walk in our neighborhood. I asked them how they were doing. That seems to be the first question we ask everyone now. In all the years I've known this family, they've been a very busy, very active family. Their children are enrolled in many programs and sports. Their calendar has always been full to overflowing. So when I asked the mother how they were doing, she said, I almost feel guilty saying this, but this has been a wonderful time for our family. We eat every meal together. The kids play outside. We're not as stressed out as we used to be. People keep telling me that when this is all over, we can go back to our normal lives. But I'm not sure I want to go back to that life. I didn't think to say this at the time. I never seemed to think of the right thing to say until a few days after the opportunity has passed. But what I wish I had said is this. We don't have to go back to that life. We don't have to go back to our pre-quarantine lives 
unaffected by the many changes this virus has wrought. Yes, of course, we want to go back to some of it. It'll be wonderful to go grocery shopping again, see one another at meeting. To have toilet paper again would be nice. To eat out with friends, to shake hands and hug and not see other people as potentially dangerous. But there are other things we don't have to go back to. Mostly the unrelenting busyness that has poisoned our lives, the hurry, the haste, the relentless demands on our time. We don't have to go back to that. After Jesus died, the disciples did not go back to their pre-Jesus lives. Their lives had been and remained inescapably changed, just as ours have been. As painful and difficult as these months have been, we can't help but affirm that right alongside the sting of loss has been the balm of grace. Neighbors, families, friends, rising to the occasion, pitching in, helping out. How can we not be changed by that? I began by asking you, what happens after death? Sometimes what happens is new life. Isn't this the lesson of Easter? That we don't go back to our old lives, our old ways, our old patterns of living. I know a man who's lived with depression for some time. He was right at that unfortunate age when telling a doctor, seeing a therapist was something to be embarrassed about, an admission of failure, an acknowledgement of weakness. So his depression worsened, persisted, until this past autumn, his wife said, I am taking you to the doctor. You will go whether you want to or not. And so they went. His wife determined, the man reluctant, but married long enough to know when he'd lost the argument. So they went. The doctor talked with the man and then said, we're going to do two things. He said, the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to send you to a therapist. The second thing I'm going to do is give you a prescription for an antidepressant. The man went to the therapist once a week for two months. Now he just goes once a month for a tune-up. He told me it's not nearly as bad as I thought it would be. And the man took his medicine. The first time he made his wife pick it up because he was too embarrassed. He didn't want the pharmacist to know he needed an antidepressant. But now he goes and he chats with the pharmacist about antidepressants and thinks maybe he should have been a pharmacist. But here's what I found most interesting. I can see the change in his face. He's a new person. Enthusiasm has replaced apathy. Happiness has taken the place of sorrow. A part of him died and something new and wonderful has been born in him. In 1976, in the journal Medical Economics, a doctor wrote an article urging his fellow physicians to never waste a crisis. He said to use every medical crisis as a unique opportunity to help improve a patient's personality, mental health, and lifestyle. A crisis almost always brings with it overlooked benefits and opportunities. Easter reminds us 
that we don't always find dead bodies in a tomb. Sometimes we find new lives. I hope your life feels new this week, friends. I think of all of you every day and look forward to the time when we can be together again at our beloved meeting with our friends, our families, and all that is good and hopeful in this world. Enjoy your week. Take care and God bless you.